Let me ask you a question this morning. Why did you come? Why did you come today? Why are you here? Let me ask, did you come to rejoice in some powerful worship? Did you do that? Did you come to enjoy the fellowship with other Christians? Did you come because, as I've heard many of you tell me before, you grew up with a drug problem? Your mom drug you to church. And so it's kind of ingrained in your life. Now you just go because that's what you've always done. Did you come because you wanted to hear an inspired message? Sorry about that. Or because you wanted the opportunity to, to give back to the Lord in a form of an offering of some sort. Did you come today because you didn't want to miss the Lord's Supper? Did you come today to get spiritually filled up to get you through this next week? Was it joy? Was it obligation? Was it a sense of need? A desire to give? Was it an act of habit? Was it a curiosity of what goes on here? I don't know. I don't know. But I do want to say this. I don't want to give you the impression that any of those are necessarily bad reasons to come. Some of those are great reasons to come. It's good to ha get in the habit of, of being here. It's good to experience powerful worship and, and anticipate that. It's good to fellowship and be encouraged. It's good to to be attracted to something greater than ourselves. And if this is your first time, and you only came out of mere curiosity, I think God still blesses that curiosity, and it's good you're here. But what if I told you there was an even greater reason to come than any I've mentioned so far? Not that any of them are bad in and of themselves, but there's something greater than even that. Not only benefits us now, but is pleasing to God in a powerful way. Would you want to know what that was? Would you want to come for that reason? If you knew what it was, would you want to come? Do you even want to know what it is? Well, if you do, hang around. If you don't, I'm sorry. <laughs> Hope you have your, your uh, uh, iPhone out so you can do something else during the sermon. Because that's what we're going to talk about. In order to show the greater motivation we ought to have for coming, for being here, and not just here, but for living our lives to the Lord, we need to go all the way back to Jesus' day. In fact, we need to go way back nearly 2,000 years ago. We need to go back before His resurrection, go back before His crucifixion. We need to go all the way back to when the people of God were still worshiping on the Sabbath day. Now, I need to make something very clear about the Sabbath day. The Sabbath day was the day that God rested. It was the seventh day, which is what day of the week? Saturday. We missed the Sabbath by day. It was yesterday. We're here today. So I want you to understand something. Today is not the Sabbath day. Yesterday was a Sabbath day. Now, that being said, in the church, we started worshiping on Sunday. One of the great reasons was, we do it now because we see it as, a, uh, as the example that the early church met on the first day of the week, but also because of what? Who rose from the grave on the first day of the week? Our Savior and our Lord. And so we worship actually on Sunday. But that does not mean, however, that some of the same principles of their worship on Saturday and our, uh, doesn't apply to our worship on Sunday. So keep that in mind. Keep that in mind. Now, like most of us, back in their day, they came for different reasons. Some of them came for all sorts of different reasons. Um, they, they, some of those reasons, by the way, even distracted them from what true worship of God was really about. Some of them were an attraction and a motivator. But I want us to look at two stories about the Sabbath. They're sandwiched together. One ends the Mark chapter 2 and one begins Mark chapter 3. So if you have a Bible, start turning that way to those two chapters. The end of Mark chapter 2, the beginning of Mark chapter 3. Now I want you to understand what happened in Jesus' day. <clears throat> in Jesus' day, what God created is something for man something powerful, something to bless us, the Pharisees, the religious leaders of Jesus' day, had transformed. They had turned the Sabbath into a day of regulation, into a day of restriction, and to be quite honest, into an occurrence that Jesus was repulsed by. They had transformed this day of blessing into a day 
of curse. Spending God was replaced with empty tradition and empty rules. And in these two examples of Mark we use uh, that we're going to use here this morning, we will see that the blessing of the Sabbath was, was supposed to be something that not only you were encouraged by as an attender there, as someone involved in it, but, but you should be encouraging others with it. It should be a blessing to others as well. And the Pharisees were just not interested in receiving such a blessing. If it conflicted with tradition, if it conflicted with their ideas and what they thought should go on, they wanted nothing to do with it. They wanted nothing to do with it. So let's look at these two stories. We're going to start reading in Mark chapter 2, starting in verse 23. So here it is. Mark chapter 2, starting in verse 23. One Sabbath, Jesus was going through the grain fields, and his disciples walked along. They began to pick some heads of grain. The Pharisees said to him, Look, why are they doing what is unlawful on the Sabbath? He answered, Have you never read what David did when he and his companions were hungry and in need? In the days of Abathar the high priest, he entered the house of God and ate the consecrated bread, which is lawful only for priests to eat. And he also gave some to his companions. Then he said to this, then he said to them, the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. So the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. Another time he went into the synagogue, and a man with a shriveled hand was there. Some of them were looking for a reason to accuse Jesus, so they watched him closely to see if he would heal him on the Sabbath. Jesus said to the man with the shriveled hand, Stand up in front of everyone. Then Jesus asked them, Which is lawful on the Sabbath, to do good or to do evil, to save life or to kill? But they remained silent. He looked around at them in anger and deeply distressed at their stubborn hearts said to the man, Stretch out your hand. He stretched it out, and his hand was completely restored. Then the Pharisees went out and began to plot with the Herodians how they might kill Jesus. Now, as I look at both of these incidents, it becomes very clear to me, very evident, that the Pharisees were not going to be happy unless everything was done how they wanted. To be honest, it did not matter if God himself came and told them to change it because God himself did come and tell them to change it. They were not going to be happy unless it was done the way they wanted it. Any change to them was seen as sinful. And not only as sinful, but was it a personal affront to them. They took it personally. They've lost sight of what God intended a relationship with him to be. And Jesus wanted to get them back on track. Jesus trying to get them to see the big picture. He wants them to see what's really going on. He wants them to understand, I'm king of the Sabbath. Man is more important. In fact, man is the important thing. God wanted to bless us. And so he gave us this day of rest I was thinking about that, and this passage in Colossians kept coming to mind. It's found in Colossians chapter 2, verses 16 and 17. This is what it says. Colossians 2, verses 16 and 17, it says, Therefore do not let anyone judge you by what you eat or drink, or with regard to a religious festival, a new moon celebration, or a Sabbath day. These are a shadow of the things that were to come. The reality, however, is found in Christ. The reality is found in Christ. Jesus not only was trying to explain to them the real meaning of the Sabbath, He is the real meaning of the Sabbath. In fact, the word Sabbath, do you know what it means? It means deep rest, which is exactly what Jesus offers all of us. Deep rest. Do you remember... Matthew chapter 11, 28 and 29, his words, here's Jesus' words. This is what he offers all of us. Matthew 11, 28 and 29. Listen to how he phrases it. He says, come to me, all you are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find 
Rest for your souls. Rest. Not just one day a week, resting from the busyness of our lives, but a relationship with Him that brings us a rest that lasts throughout our lives. A rest that not only lasts throughout our lives, but lasts into the next life. See, that's what the Pharisees were missing. They had transformed the day of rest, the relationship of rest, into a day of chore, a day of regulation, a day of curse. The question is, are we experiencing the rest that Jesus offers us? Have we accepted Him as King and Lord of the Sabbath? See, when Jesus calls us into His rest, the question is, what does that really look like? And that's what I want to focus on this morning. What does that rest look like? Well, the first thing you need to understand is that we have been called to rest from religion. We have been called to rest from religion. Now, it is so easy for us to turn everything into a list of do's and don'ts. You know what I mean? <clears throat> a checklist of proper activities that you can involve yourself in. Restrictions. Re given with, I'm sure some people had good intentions to help us be better people, but restrictions nonetheless that God didn't write. See, sometimes we allow our good intentions to turn our rest into religion. And in doing so, we enslave ourselves as Christians once again. Jesus says, I am the reality of what all these things were for forecasting. I'm the one who, who makes them all true. I'm the one in which you find your rest. And after he tells us, I'm the reality in Colossians chapter 2, you need to listen to what he says about so-called good rules. Because in Colossians chapter 2, he follows that up, starting in verse 20. This is what he says. Colossians chapter 2, verse 20 and following, he says, since you died with Christ, or God's word says, I should say, since you died with Christ to the basic principles of this world, why, as though you still belong to them, do you submit to its rules? Do not handle, do not taste, do not touch. These are all destined to perish with use because they are based on human commands and teachings. Such regulations, indeed, have an appearance of wisdom with their self-imposed worship, their false humility, and their harsh treatment of the body, but they lack any value in restraining sensual indulgence. There is no rest in rules or regulation or restriction. They sometimes have the appearance of benefit, but in truth they steal away your joy. I love it how the New Living Translation puts it in Galatians 5.1. The New Living Translation in Galatians 5.1 says this, So Christ has really set us free. Now make sure that you stay free. And don't get tied up again in slavery to the law. The law enslaves us, but the rest we find in Jesus Christ sets us free. Because it's not about self-justification anymore. It's about grace in Him. <clears throat> the movie Chariots of Fire is based on a true story about two Olympians in Paris that competed in 1924. Now one of them is, we are familiar with probably, his name is Eric Lydell. I hope I said his name right. He was a Christian. He refused to run on Sunday. And as a result, he lost the chance for a gold medal in the race that he was favored to win. At one level, taking a day off for rest is what the movie is about. But the movie added another level when it contrasted Harold Abrahams with Lydell. Abrahams and Lydell were both trying very hard to win gold medals. But Abraham Hams was doing it out of a need to prove himself. And at one point, speaking of the sprint that he was in getting ready to compete in, he said, I've got 10 seconds to justify my existence. Lydell, on the other hand, simply wanted to please God who had already uh, provided him and accepted, provided him with his gift and accepted him for who he was. That's why he told his sister this. He said, God made me fast, and when I run, I feel his pleasure. Now, Harold Abrahams was weary even when he was rested, but Eric Lydell, he was rested even when he was exerting himself. Now you may ask yourself, why? Why could he rest even in the midst of exerting himself? And the truth is because there's a work underneath of our work that we really need rest from. 
It is the work of self-justification. It is the work that often leads us into, in, to take refuge in religion. It is the idea that I can do enough, I can be enough, I can show enough, I can live up to some mark that makes me worthy of what God has given me. The truth is there is no such place. You either accept the grace of God and rest from religion or you're trapped by religion. The second thing we need to understand is that we have been called to rest in relationship. The very things the Pharisee got mad about, what Jesus had done, nourishing and healing on, on the Sabbath, is exactly the things we should find our rest in. Jesus is nourishing and healing ability in our life. We rest not because we've accomplished it or deserve it. We rest because He loves us and provides it. We often think resting in the Lord means relaxation, even hibernation. You ever, talk, ever, ever go home and say, you know, all afternoon I took my Sunday nap. It's more like your Sunday slumber. It took you, you, three hours later, you're still sleeping on the couch. See, day of rest. Problem is we've got things confused. That's not really what Jesus called us to. I have nothing wrong with a nap on Sunday, don't get me wrong. But that's not what he wants us to do. He wants us to rest in our relationship with him, which really should motivate us to love others. One of my favorite verses, 1 John chapter 3, verse 16. We've all heard John 3, 16, but 1 John 3, 16, I love so much. Because in 1 John 3, 16, this is what we're told. This is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us. Lots of us like to stop there, but he goes on and says, and we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers. Think about it. We rest in Jesus' love because there is no other place that is secure than that. But when we find ourselves in that love, we should be motivated to love other people. When I was in high school, junior high and high school, I never was a very good athlete. Not that I'm a very good athlete today either, but I, I tried a lot of different things. I, in fact, I did many things. I wrestled, I ran track, I ran cross country, played tennis. I'm trying to think of any other sports I did. I golfed. I never got any good at that either. You know what, though? Every one of my matches that was, you know, possible, my mom and dad were there, every single one. In fact, I remember once I was wrestling, I was out on the mat, we were wrestling, and this guy was just wearing me out. And he had a hold of my arm, and I could not escape. And, and I was about to be pinned. And I'm struggling, and I'm struggling, and I'm struggling. And all of a sudden, I hear out of the stands my mom and dad. And they're saying, get your arm loose. Get your arm loose. I'm struggling to get my arm loose. They keep yelling, you need to get your arm loose. And I finally yelled back, I'm trying. Now the truth is, <laughs> they didn't do much cheering after that. <laughs> at least that day, they kind of stopped at that point. And I eventually, I believe, if I recall right, got pinned and was, you know, lost the match. But you know what? The truth of the matter was, I kept trying sport after sport. I did them for years. I mean, I did wrestling for five or six years. I wrestled. Not because I was any good at it, but you know why? Because my parents loved me, and they encouraged me, and they essentially said, we don't care if you win or lose, we just care if you do the best you can. If you're having a good time, if you're really giving it your all. There is something freeing in knowing that you are loved like that. You don't have to be good, you just have to do the best you can. There is something freeing to that. And that's what Jesus offers us. That very same thing. My parents gave me a freedom to do more than I ever would have done on my own because they gave me unconditional love. They didn't find their satisfaction in my abilities. They found their satisfaction in me doing whatever to the best of my ability. In 1 John chapter 4, 8, verses 18 and 19, this is what we're told. 1 John chapter 4, verses 18 and 19, it says, There is no fear in love, 
But perfect love drives out fear because fear has to do with punishment. The one who fears is not made perfect in love. And then he goes on with a very simple verse, verse 19. We love because he loved, because he first loved us. We've been set free to love. We've been accepted by God. His grace has covered our sin. He loves us for who we are. Not that He wants us to stay who we are. He wants us to become more and more like Him. But He loves us, and that should free us to love others. That relationship should be the most freeing thing in our life. Jesus has called us to find our confidence in His love. Not about being good enough. Not about earning your way in. Not about proving yourself. It's not about hitting the mark. It's about being loved and loving others. The truth is you may have come for all the wrong reasons today. Maybe that's just too strong. You may have come for all sorts of reasons that weren't the best today. But you don't have to leave that way. No matter why you came, you don't have to leave the same way you came. In fact, it's my desire every single day that we leave different than we came. Jesus can give you rest. In fact, He came to give you rest. Rest from religion and all of its just self-justifying activities. Rest in relationship where you have been freed by love to love. I hope that you can leave this morning experiencing that rest. And I hope that you can leave this morning proclaiming the same words as the psalmist in Psalm 116, verse 7, where the psalmist says, Be at rest once more, O my soul, for the Lord has been good to me, good to you. Jesus came, Lord of the Sabbath, King of the Sabbath, came, to bring you rest in your life. Not just rest today, but rest every day of your life. Resting in a relationship with Him. Resting from the constraints of religion so that you can love because you've been loved. Will you pray with me? Heavenly Father, I thank You. I thank You for the love You have shown me. I thank You for the loving parents that You gave me that has shown me uh, in a small way the greatness of your unconditional love for me. Lord, I pray for each one here. We run around in this world from one thing to the next, from one ball game to the other, from one practice, from one appointment, from one business meeting, from one chore. On and on and on it goes. Our schedule seems so very busy. We give no time to the realization of the to experience the realization of the relationship we're in with you. We give no time, no time to your love and to the loving of others. So Lord, I pray for each one here that they will find their rest in you. And they can stop, start, I should say, resting from religion and start resting in relationship. Let us be set free, Lord, is my prayer. Each one here. It's my prayer for them that we are set free to find our rest in you. I pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen.